Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Dissecting Fiction Podcast. I'm Vinnie Murphy. I'm Christian Cutliffe. And today we're going to do another focus on a creator. Yeah, but uh, this time we're uh, going to kind of talk about comic books instead of movies. Not exactly new ground for us, but... <laughs> yeah. We're going to talk about Jonathan Hickman, primarily his Marvel work. Well, we're focusing mainly on the Marvel stuff because that's kind of been his biggest career stuff outside of a few indie books here and there. He seems to really have gotten his footing in sort of the mid-aughts. Or the mid-aughts. And during the kind of like Rising Star era, era with like Morrison and Bendis. He's kind of that generation of writers. But uh, we're talking about him because of the new X-Men events. House of X and Powers of Ten. Yes, it is called Powers <laughs> of Ten. Yeah, and apparently uh, it was said in one of the videos on Marvel's YouTube where they were prepping everyone for the massive amount of information you needed to know going in <laughs> to the relaunch. Um, I was tipped off to that from uh, my friend Bob, who is likely listening to this. Hello, Bob. Hi, Bob. So um, we're going to start off with his early career before kind of talking about his big runs, and then... We'll kind of tap in and out about where X-Men have been in the last couple of years because the House of X and Powers of Ten event has been kind of necessary for the X-Men line. Yeah, it's going to hopefully reforming for the, the line. Not that things have been universally bad, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Hickman's sort of first widely read work was the Nightly News, which he wrote and illustrated, notably, for Image Comics. That was back in 2006. He also had his first Marvel work not too long after that, in August of 2007. He did a Living Mummy backup in a Legion of Monsters uh, Satana one-shot. I have a lot of weird comics, and I have some of the Legion of Monsters one-shots. I don't have that one, and it really bothered me when I went to look back. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's cool. I can read a Living... I was like, oh, I, get, I probably got rid of that one already. Easy probably didn't know who he was at that time. Well, I didn't know who he was at that time, and uh, I may not have bought it initially. I might have like picked the monsters, the, the Legion of Monsters, that I, <laughs> I felt were uh, more interesting to me. But he, he basically works it at Image, uh, putting out creator-owned stuff for a, a couple of years there. You get some work in the Pop Gun anthology. The biggest one, and the one that I remember first hearing about Hickman on, was uh, Pax Romana, which is a time travel story which uh, I think is going to be kind of important. <laughs> it's a theme with a lot of his work is time travel. Not everything, but it kind of is a core for a lot of his big runs is time travel. Um, and we'll get about the themes. I kind of feel like he writes about a lot because they're all kind of consistent across many of his books. Right, I would agree with that. Next couple of years, uh, that's really where he sort of stays his image. He comes back to Marvel near the end of 2008 and does what starts off as a digital-only book, uh, Astonishing Tales Mojo World. Everyone's favorite, Mojo. I love Mojo. I'd actually love to see like an X-Men movie with Mojo in it. That'd be, I hope they put him in New Mutants. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I would, and I was able to track down a little bit of the Mojo World uh, comic. I Obviously, it started out as digital. It did come out eventually in print later. They collected a bunch of these stories they had done under the Astonishing Tales banner for the digital service. What's cool about that Astonishing Tales book is uh, Hickman actually illustrates that as well. He did a lot of cover work around this period, too, which I think is interesting because he's not really known as an artist anymore. No, he kind of has that weird trajectory with, like, uh, Jeff Lemire, too, where Jeff Lemire is kind of like, he's a comic book artist, but he's mainly known for his writing, especially on, like, his biggest runs. It's him writing, not him illustrating. Which I think is interesting, too, because they come off around the same time. Yeah. Uh, his first really big work at Marvel is uh, April 2009. We're going cover dates here, folks. We know you had it a little before that. Uh, and that's on Secret Warriors along with Bendis. Yeah, this was kind of, um, this is post Osborne running S.H.I.E.L.D. So this is kind of between, in between like eras of Marvel, Marvel comics. Right, it's really like the, I would say the lead book for the Dark Reign stuff because it's, it's about S.H.I.E.L.D. itself. And all these other clandestine organizations were really one thing, and so when they collapse, they all collapse. 
And Hickman goes on to do the Fantastic Four, which is where he really starts to pop off. Yeah, and he kind of tears the Fantastic Four to pieces. Okay, I'll say this. like Hickman's FF number one was the first comic book I bought because they were rebooting. They were launched to FF around that time. Like I think it was about two or three months before New 52 was starting. That's accurate, but he'd been on Fantastic Four for quite a while at that point. He starts in October of 2009, and in between there, and this is another thing that Hickman's really well known for, is his run on S.H.I.E.L.D. begins in June 2010, and this isn't a S.H.I.E.L.D. book about a bunch of secret agents. This is like this whole history about how S.H.I.E.L.D. has existed since like the dawn of man in the Marvel Universe, and... Leonardo da Vinci was a member of S.H.I.E.L.D., (laughs) and it creates this whole sort of new timeline for the Marvel Universe, something that they supposedly were looking for for quite a while, and this is really the payoff. I remember there were even rumors when uh, 1602 came out, the uh, Neil Gaiman book, that that was going to do something and create like a time loop so like Marvel would have this continuity where like the reason no one aged is because everyone was like stuck in this weird time thing. Marvel was kind of going through a lot of different things at this time because this is during the Disney mergers as well. These ideas kind of never manifested uh, for various reasons. It's interesting, too, because it's right around this time that the industry starts to slow like <laughs> really badly. This is where like companies are getting very worried that comic books are not going to survive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh... <laughs> Again, this is when I got into comics, is right before like people were saying this is the death knell of the industry. That's fine. I got into comics at the exact same time the 10 years prior when they said that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Like I mentioned, FF was kind of the first book I bought. And I think we can kind of start there with the Fantastic Four and S.H.I.E.L.D. runs as well, because I, I think the Fantastic Four future foundation run kind of show off Hickman's, all basically all of Hickman's style. Because some Fantastic Four can kind of go across space and time and do whatever whatever the fuck they want. And there's also an element uh, that he kind of starts with in the Fantastic Four run where coming into FF, you have like Spider-Man joining. Well, that's why I bought it because Spider-Man, I like Spider-Man. <laughs> and Spider-Man had a cool white suit on. I was like, oh, that's a cool suit. It is a really cool design too. It still holds up. And it's not unprecedented, the relationship between the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man. That's well established. Yeah. It's you know, an amazing Spider-Man one thing. But it kind of shows something that Hickman's going to seemingly do a lot in the coming years, which is kind of break the walls between books, where he's really bringing a lot of characters together that not necessarily never interacted, but making his big stories the focus for an immense amount of characters. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, because the Fantastic Four, when I bought that FF issue, I remember reading it and I was like, who are these characters? Because there's so many characters. They had a, uh, you know, like Reed Richards' son, Reed Richards' daughter, who's also like Doom's daughter. I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> I was like, there's a dragon that's also a professor. What's happening? He's a, he's a robot. He's, like, he's a robot. A yeah. he's and, a... <laughs> and, but uh, I think Hickman's books can only survive in the internet era because I had to go on Wikipedia and like read up on all these characters and what they are, who they are. Why are they there? What do they do? And I, I think that's kind of carried over throughout his entire career because he likes to draw on these kind of old characters and bring them into this big universe-expanding story. Right, and it's funny. It goes against most of my sort of instincts on how to write characters well. Like I, I think I always lean towards focus and allowing characters to develop within sort of a, a little seclusion from the rest of a collective universe absolutely not what hickman seems to ever do when he's dealing with Marvel. <laughs> no uh because the fantastic four and future foundation run kind of go into the avengers run he does later on which we'll get into in a moment but it also ties in with this ultimate comics run where he pulls out all kinds of weird crazy ideas too yeah and the thing with the fantastic four run i think maybe part of the reason that fantastic four fans seem to accept it pretty well and you know, he is expanding the roster, uh, literally and figuratively. <laughs> but in that run, he was only kind of playing with things that really were pretty directly related to the Fantastic Four. Yeah. He just was playing with everything that was related to the Fantastic Four. Which uh, was like most of the Marvel Universe. 
it felt like a lot of times. Yeah, would, that's true, because Fantastic Four in a lot of ways are sort of the, the real beginning of the modern vision of what Marvel is. Yeah. That sort of move away from your almost archetypal superheroes that DC was really doing, and really everyone was doing prior to the, the Marvel age, if you will, and focusing more on, like, familial interaction and you know how do these characters relate to each other these they don't get along but they're fighting alongside each other which is what dc wasn't doing at all at the time i I think i think he draws out that really well because i will say this he writes really damn good doom i think i think he writes an excellent doom and i think his run kind of weighed on later runs it Uh, weighed on a lot because it basically weighed on everything but x-men right it, it tied in with avengers iron man Everybody but the X-Men, which was kind of like its own separate universe that sometimes interacted. Well, there's not unlike the Fantastic Four, the X-Men have kind of a big enough family to play with without really needing to dig into too much. The style that Hickman wrote Fantastic Four in, I think, has kind of become Fantastic Four in contemporary versions. I think even James Robinson's last run before, you know, they all I think they all died. Maybe they all died. Something like that. They got that's, better. That's how many people... I, I think the Human Torch has died seven times. That's what, I made up <laughs> well, that number, but it feels died. like it. Didn't he die twice in the Fantastic Four run? At bare minimum, he's died twice. I, <laughs> I would almost be certain there has to be another one in there somewhere we're missing. But you see sort of tinges of Hickman in anything Fantastic Four since then. Even the, the current slot run, very, very much tied into that FF thing. Well, the Future Foundation, I feel like, got into a lot what made the Fantastic Four, like, an interesting concept in that it was, like, a family, and he was trying to make the family into, like, a company. That sounds a bit, like, melodramatic, like I'm describing Batman Incorporated, but it was more like trying to grow up the next generation, and I think that's why he tapped into the idea of Fantastic Four always having been there in the Marvel Universe, and kind of always ushering, like, another generation. But it's interesting that you brought up Batman Incorporated because I think that's a really, really valid comparison where you're kind of taking – you're looking for the cores of the character and after all these decades, you've ended up with this humongous cast and you're trying to figure out a way to use that. And I think that's both what Morrison and Hickman were kind of doing in those mut- – in, both in FF and in Batman Incorporated. It's, it's a very similar idea. You're looking for the core of the character – after all these contrivances and all these extra characters being thrown in there, but you can't get rid of any of these things because to someone out there, that's the version of the story that they're most tied to. You know, like you were joking about Dragon Man. Guarantee you there are a bunch of people who are super pumped to see Dragon Man in that run. And he was a really big part of that run too because he was the teacher of the FF. But the big thing with the Fantastic Four run is that it kind of establishes... Not just multiple universes, but that Reed Richards' son and daughter were going to kind of inherit the Marvel Universe at some point. Yeah, and there was always little hints at that, uh, especially with Franklin and uh, like Onslaught. And, yeah, being an Omega level. Right. Big nod to that in the... Uh, oh, hold on. There's going to be a lot of spoilers coming up in the second half of this, so uh, first well, spoiler warning. In the really recent history of the Marvel Universe... They very much focus on Franklin. <laughs> yeah, in one of the issues, they list out a bunch of Omega level mutants, and Franklin's one of them. They say in that issue he's not affiliated with anything. Right. Which is probably going to be important later on. The uh, Psylord. <laughs> that was his code name when he was an adult. Oh, they gosh. changed it to Powerhouse now. Powerhouse. Yeah. Which Psylord. Is, his, code, his code name doesn't matter. <laughs> Franklin <laughs> Richards. I think it's interesting to talk about, like, Fantastic Four being this big family, and then the ultimate Fantastic Four, which Hickman was also writing, as well as the ultimate, like, Avengers at that time, was about a family kind of tearing itself apart. And that whole line, uh, which Hickman had a ton of influence over, he was one of the writers on Ultimate Fallout, um, which is is all happening around 2011. Yeah, at this point, there was basically just two writers on the Ultimate line, because they kind of just said, this isn't working. There was just Bendis on Spider-Man, and then Hickman was kind of doing whatever you wanted. They had the Ultimate X-Men books, but those weren't being really, like, touched much. They were being touched by Hickman in small ways, 
but his big thing was focusing on the Fantastic Four and introducing an evil Reed Richards. And this was a whole idea, too, at the end of the Ultimate run, which we're pretty close to. You know, the original concept of Ultimate Marvel, which becomes Ultimate Comics and, you know, however you want to label it, was supposed to be, like, really accessible stories, characters that were not weighed down by this these decades of continuity that, you know, the regular Marvel Universe was. And somehow, in, like, a decade, they made it as convoluted as the regular Marvel Universe. I feel like they made it more convoluted because... Unlike, we mentioned a little bit earlier, like, me going through Wikipedia to look through all these characters. Right. <laughs> Ultimates didn't have that, because people just did not care about Ultimates at that point. Right. Like, you had big, you had some articles on, like, oh, what happened to Invisible Woman Reed Richards, because they were prominent. But, like, finding an article on, like, Machine Man right. in the Ultimate <laughs> Universe is, like, you weren't, you weren't going to find that anywhere. And I think that's part of the reason why the Ultimate line kind of collapsed on itself. Especially towards the end, which I think Hickman kind of ended it himself. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't disagree with that. I think he saw. I mean, I'm sure also he was in on editorial yeah. and they were telling these things. But I think he saw an opportunity to kind of go as nuts as you possibly can because why not? Yeah, and uh, which is brings in these really funny and interesting ideas. The thing where Reed Richards makes and builds a giant biodome. And he makes an entire world inside that biodome, the most advanced people, and they try to take over the world. The Avengers have to stop him. But that ties in with his Avengers run in the mainline 616 continuity. Right. And that really kind of kicks off with Avengers versus X-Men in 2012. Going to kind of kick off the second part of our argument. Yeah, which is where we're going to talk about mainly the X-Men and Hickman and, like, touch apart the Avengers a little bit too, because Hickman kind of draws them all in together. Let's rewind a little bit. You know, we've kind of made it up to near the end of 2011 going into 2012, but if we're going to talk X-Men, we have to pull back a little bit. We go back to, say, 2001. You have Grant Morrison writing X-Men, uh, New X-Men, as it is labeled at the time, along with some uh, companion books on Uncanny that never quite fared as well and didn't <laughs> Chuck Austin. <laughs> I don't. I don't universally hate Chuck Austin. I think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I think U.S. War Machine was actually super cool. No one talks about that book anymore. Check <laughs> that. that. The three D one? No, the second one's the three D one. The first one was hand drawn at least. <laughs> okay. No, the second one does get a little silly. The first one's kind of cool. Also, like really cool patch design for like that fake military outfit. I really <laughs> enjoyed. But you get kind of like. A little golden age of X-Men in the early 2000s. You have Morrison, and then Morrison's followed up by Whedon on Astonishing, which is a harsh turn from new X-Men. Well, it's going from these, from like Morrison's idea of a big world and focusing on what the X-Men mean, and then to Whedon's much more personal, character-driven X-Men. And I think, I think Whedon kind of loses it after a little while, to be honest. I think the, the early issues of Astonishing are great. And then as it starts to wrap up, it's not as strong. The next big hope for X Men now they're on this hot streak is Ed Brubaker. Ho- oh, well, the, there's a hope later too. <laughs> you can talk about that. You know more about than I do. Is really Brubaker coming on for Deadly Genesis, where they do a little retconning and add in another team of X Men, and finally <laughs> reveal the third Summers brother in Vulcan. Which is a cool name. Yeah, Vulcan that, Havoc Cyclops. Which I'm sure Disney hates because there's, there's just no way they can like copyright that effectively. <laughs> uh, there's many, many of Vulcan out there. You then kind of come out of Deadly Genesis. You got like this momentum. And I think it's right around then that it starts to like lose it a little bit. They, they start introducing a lot of time travel stories. Uh, this is kind of when they introduce the idea of like Newton's always going to be wiped out. Because you have Hope Summers come into the picture, Bishop trying to kill Hope Summers, and Cable kind of protecting Hope. And Hope is supposed to be like a messiah figure for the mutants. Which kind of plays off some ideas of the new X-Men stuff, of like mutants having their own Jesus figure. But this is where it kind of gets complicated, because a lot of these runs kind of get ran over by the time 2012 comes along, and we have... Avengers versus X-Men. Yeah, I just remember there being nothing really to grab onto. I, I did read X-Men books in those periods for, mm-hmm. like, short spurts. 
And uh, outside of some really cool Wolverine stuff that was being done at the time, I can't really even tell you what was going on. I mean, I, I think it's important to show, like, how Morrison approached the X-Men and how, like, we didn't approach the X-Men at that time. Like, Morrison was very concerned about, like, Genosha was killing the X-Men because it was secluding them on Genosha. Just, like, this tiny island outside of California or wherever it was at that time. <laughs> because it moves constantly. It's an asteroid that Magneto controls. <laughs> and by the time, like, 2011 rolls around, they're back on Genosha, like, stuck on that little island. Which is the polar opposite of Morrison's idea of, like, the X-Men being a global phenomenon. I, and, I, and I think at that point, Morrison's fear of, like, Genosha strangling the X-Men was coming true at that point. <laughs> in, a, in a very, like, real editorial way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You also, around this time, start to see both Marvel and DC looking for the answer to fix this problem of declining sales. Uh, DC goes with the New 52, which I, I'm the more we've had preliminary discussions about things, I think we should do a podcast on. I, I think it'd be interesting because, I, like I mentioned before, that was my introduction to comics outside of a few touches here and there. And we, in the past, there has been a Dissecting Fiction episode on that. But I don't think we got into as much as we can. I it's think we can canon. revisit it. It's not canon. <laughs> it is canon. Watch the videos are fun. Right? <laughs> Watch the, the, the horror movie ones are really good. I enjoyed making those. Um, <laughs> this put myself over there. I was like, yes, the things I made were good. <laughs> um, I, I think there's a lot to explore. Like in that couple of years, from like 2010 to like 2000, until now, really. But Within like that sort of panic, there's a lot of interesting topics, and I think part of that panic was Avengers vs. X-Men, to be honest with you. Because there was a lot of copyright problems, too, at this time. Because not only was Disney getting control of Marvel, they also didn't have control of the X-Men, because that was rights for Fox. People have already forgotten, and we've talked about this in the MCU episodes, is X-Men, Spider-Man, Hulk... The three things that like Disney did not have complete control over for many years were the biggest Marvel franchises. Absolutely. Avengers vs. X-Men, we both kind of talked about this, that it, we have read it and both felt it was kind of sloppy. Yeah, it's one of Hick Hickman probably didn't have absolute control over this, unlike many of his other runs, because this feels like a lot of hands on the wheel. We don't even have to really speculate about that. If you, ca if you check out some of interviews, even contemporary ones to the issues of that coming out uh hickman talks about being in writers rooms and talking to editors and things so it, no he did not have the type of control that he did before or uh, after i would say the sort of ultimate result outside of professor x dying again uh <laughs> again again is they kind of merge the x-men and the avengers in a weird way yeah because <sighs> Again, we, we talked about the X-Men were kind of in a weird point. They were pretty secluded, and Hickman likes drawing these big worlds. And in order to make this big world, he has the X-Men get possessed by the Phoenix Force, which is a psychic force of all life. It's complicated. Yeah, read your, your history of the Marvel Universe, and uh, Mark Wade will help you understand all this. Yeah, but <laughs> but we're touching on this plot a little bit because like it, it sets the tone for the X-Men for like the next seven years in a really heavy way in that cyclops kind of becomes the bad guy which i think is an interesting turn for the character after like seeing how much pressure is on him all the time it's funny you see it as that i, I actually I, I also like it but i always saw it as at their core the x-men stories are about militant political group you know you, yeah, you throw cool. in time travel you throw in aliens you throw in the fact that you also have, you know, the God of Thunder running around the same world. Like, it, it messes with it a little bit. Professor X dying, Professor X being this intellectual, philosophical leader for the X-Men, right? He has his, his A number one guy, Cyclops, who's this sort of zealot, if you think about it that way. Yeah, he's when, been with him for years. And, like, even if you read, like, the early X-Men stuff from the 80s, he's, he trusts Xavier completely. And I think that was sort of why I liked it is because that seemed like a justification to me was, all right, you have this guy who's been portrayed as this, like, Boy Scout compared to Wolverine, who is, you know, an ex-assassin, ex-military guy, gruff, 
in reality, he's not so much a Boy Scout because he's, once again, a militant political figure. And now he's a militant political figure who's lost his moral compass. Having him go completely off the rails makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I I do too, because he's been through like the genocide of Genosha, um, which is the big event in the new X-Men where there's a genocide of the mutants. <laughs> um, he's seen all this really horrible stuff and has weighed on him all these years, and it becomes more and more militant as time goes on. And the funny part is you say like he's seen all this stuff. He's also aware that there are 20 futures that are completely like horrible. Yeah, and some of them he's the cause of. Right. <laughs> and like... <laughs> Then he gets possessed by the Phoenix Force, and it gives him, like, all this power all of a sudden, and it kind of makes him go crazy. And, like, Emma kind of goes off the wheel, too. Like, all these support figures slowly fade away from his life. And I think it's really cool seeing him turn into a bad guy. But because of that, it kind of throws off the entire X-Men line for many years, because stuff like Hope Summers gets thrown to the sidelines. Remender kind of comes in with his uncanny X-Force stuff, and that gets thrown to the sideline, too. And we get into this weird era where they're, like, constantly introducing and dropping plot points. Yeah, and it's not terribly long after this that Wolverine is, uh, quote-unquote, killed off. He gets better. He does eventually get better. <laughs> not too... Uh, pretty recently, I guess. Uh, but it, you really do. You end up where a lot of your main X-Men cast that has been sort of the anchor is gone. The whole premise is kind of gone. Because they focus also, too, on, like, just kind of, like, a core, like, 15, 20 X-Men, when the whole point of the X-Men is kind of, like, they're infinite, you know? There's an X-Men for everybody. That's kind of been my idea right. of an X-Men. And now it's just, like, the same 10 and 15 X-Men for the last 30 years that we're focusing on. And that that really, you know, that started in House of M. Right, after No More Mutants, which is a whole nother thing. But they also kind of retcon that, too, later on. I was reading uh, an interview just prior to Hickman starting, and it was Hickman and I, I believe his editor, and they were talking about that. And I'm obviously paraphrasing here. But you went from, like, the new X-Men era, where Morrison's whole point was, like, this is, like, a real minority. Like, this is, you know, something that's present in this world. And they tried to get rid of that, and it it doesn't hold as much weight at that point because no one has seen a mutant. If you're in rural Ohio... You never saw a mutant at all. And that was never the point. Like, people were supposed to see mutants. People were to, it's supposed to be something that was very visible. Well, that was the whole point of the X-Men, too, is, like, Xavier saying, come out, my X-Men. He was showing the world the mutants. And then after House of M, where they reduce mutants to about, like, 300 people, and then Avengers vs. X-Men comes along, and they show them as, like, this paramilitary force and everything. It gets really weird. But that also ties in, since Hickman was running the reel in Avengers vs. X-Men, he kind of ties that into Avengers, because Xavier dying kicks off the events of his Avengers run. Hickman's vision of the Avengers is sort of, all right, now I have even more characters to play with here, and that's sort of the concept he's running with, is almost like a Justice League Unlimited of Avengers. It, it wasn't just, like, a paramilitary force for, like, the world. It was a paramilitary force for the entire universe. Right. And he's now throwing in, you know, some of his favorite X-Men, which is cool. Mainly, like, because Xavier died, he was part of the Illuminati, which were, like, a cabal of the top minds of the world and kept eyes on the universe. And he had all the different figures from all over the universe, like Captain America, Iron Man, Reed Richards... Which is where his Fantastic Four comes in as Namor. well. Namor. Namor. Who we're also Fantastic Who's, Four. Who also becomes an X-Men around this point, I think, right? Yeah, he, he is. It's kind of just though, because Namor hates everybody. <laughs> so he's like, I'll, I'll show up because you invited me, but I'm not going to like it. The Avengers run kind of becomes his continuation of the Fantastic Four run. But it keeps playing off this theme of this expansion of where like everyone is kind of tied to each other. The Avengers at this point become more of, like I said before, like Justice League Unlimited, where like every team is really part of the Avengers is how it's sort of played. That also ties into a bunch of other event books we won't really get into where they're fighting Thanos because Hickman is known for, I think, dragging out his books for a while. Because what, Secret Wars is 2016 it ends, so he's on this run for like three years. You don't want to breeze over the Thanos stuff. No, it's important because a lot of that gets incorporated into the Marvel movies. They don't incorporate his son, but they incorporate the Black Order, which are like Thanos' top generals of his army. 
And it's really the first significant Thanos story since Guardians and that whole run about 10 years. Well, not even 10 years at that point, around five years prior. Yeah. It really kind of reestablishes Thanos as like this massive threat, not just a galactic threat. Prior to this era, a lot of those intergalactic heroes were very separate. Yeah, here they all kind of get corporate together because the universe is constantly in trouble. And there's a lot of butting heads between like Captain America and Iron Man at this point. And that's based off the Civil War stuff as well, where they're trying to save the universe, but they have different ideas of how to do it. All of this kind of points into Secret Wars, not Marvel Superhero Secret Wars, or... (laughs) Brian Michael Bendis' Secret War. A different story, uh, which I think is super interesting, because while I don't think it's 100% strong top to bottom, I think it goes a little long, as you were kind of saying, like things get stretched. It's kind of the only Marvel equivalent of A Crisis on Infinite Earths. Yeah, because at this point, the Ultimate line was for definitely ending. Everybody kind of knew it. And this is where Doom really gets in control, because this is all stuff he established in like his 2009 Fantastic Four run. Like right. Doom doing all this Doom crazy shit. <laughs> and he gets control. That'd be good for a pitch meeting. I want a film where Doom does all this Doom crazy shit. <laughs> and he gets control of like the Infinity Stones, and he makes all these time bombs that blow up universes, until basically he's control of everything. Because of that, it integrates the Ultimate Universe. It integrates Miles into the mainline continuity, Fighter Gwen, other side characters, and it gives Marvel an excuse to like merge a bunch of timelines, much like Crisis on Infinite Earth. Yeah, and also much like Crisis on Infinite Earth, not too long after that, it starts to break up again. <laughs> yeah, not not for the fault of Hickman, but this is... At this point, yeah, this is all like Hickman stuff from like Avengers vs. X Men, Fantastic Four, Shield, his Avengers run, all culminating like right here. Even his Ultimate Avengers stuff culminating here. Because Evil Reed Richards comes into the mainline universe too. Now Maker. Maker, yeah, the Maker. And he's actually uh, he's in a bunch of books. He's uh, he's a cool. He's a really he, cool. He's become villain. a cool character, used incredibly well by uh, Al Ewing, both in Ultimates. Al Ewing's Ultimates not being an Ultimate Universe book, being like Space Avengers. Um, <laughs> and uh, his current run on Immortal Hulk, uh, Maker's also in that. It's always a good sign when you create a character. Or like, That's the weird thing with Maker, though, is like, who did create it? Because it starts off as just Reed Richards and it kind of becomes this other thing. Yeah, he gets burned by a lot of people and then Hickman kind of grows him into a bunch of loops. But with Secret Wars, uh, we swear we're coming back to the (laughs) X-Men. After Secret Wars, with all these timelines kind of merging and all these continuities merging together, the X-Men are left out in the cold. Yeah, by the time Secret Wars is over, nothing's really affected the X-Men. You still have a lot of the story strains from Bendis' all-new X-Men, which brought the original X-Men forward in time. I was never super into that. I don't know about you. No, not a lot of people were, from what I could tell. Because a lot of it is just spinning its wheels. And, like, the main thing is, like, oh, this is cool for, like, six issues. What if, what would young Cyclops think of modern Cyclops being this really big militant? But then Bendis stretches it into, like, 40 issues. And it's just like, we get it. Cyclops is bad. <laughs> and... <laughs> And he's not even that much of a bad guy, which is why I think it's such like a disappointing run, because you can kind of see where Cyclops is coming from with all of this, and where Wolverine's coming with all of this. Also, there's Remender's Uncanny X-Force being kind of its own thing, and then Remender doing his own thing with the Avengers. But basically, he forgets the X-Men, he's like, I can, I can just do whatever I want now. <laughs> there is there is an attempt, though, to kind of reorganize the X-Men book. What you start off with is X-Men Gold, X-Men Blue... Harkening back to the old early 90s team splits. X-Men Gold being what would be considered, I guess, like a contemporary team. X-Men Blue being the all-new X-Men along with Ultimate Wolverine's son. I don't know what his... Does he have a name? I think it's... It's not Logan. It's like some kind of Louisiana name. Yeah. That guy. He's blonde. Um, (laughs) And... (laughs) But to those books' credit, they did do a good job of sort of setting X-Men back in a direction. X-Men started to feel like X-Men again. Uh, I especially fond of 
X-Men Gold and the last run on the Astonishing X-Men book that was running at that time is also pretty cool. It uses a lot of the weird stuff that had happened in like the last decade and throws it all together. But that only makes it until 2018 where it's relaunched again as an Uncanny X-Men 1 with basically all the teams from those books coming together with all of their different stories and trying to kind of merge it and also do this whole thing with X-Men. As much as I liked the writers on it, it just felt like kind of a mess. There were so many dangling plot lines and so many different ideas that just like got dropped and introduced constantly. And it became hard to just like tie them all together. And you had a lot of characters just disappear and coming in and out constantly. And I think at 2018 was the breaking point, especially for the X-Men line. I wonder, the team on Uncanny, how much they knew was about to happen with Hickman. Like, when those pitches came in and when they knew that they were going to have to kind of wrap it up. Maybe part of that disorganization was when they did Uncanny X-Men 1, they already kind of knew where this was going. I'd imagine, because he would have to pitch it pretty far in advance, especially with how complicated... Hickman's House of X and Powers of Ten line is. And that's right, Powers of Ten. But this is where we finally get to Hickman's new event comic in that uh, it, it's kind of a reboot of the entire X-Men line. At least that's where it seems like it's going to now. And yeah, and now we're going to get into some... Uh, we know these books are only like a couple of weeks old, so it's if, you'd like, if you want to bow out now so you can read them, spoilers are, are about to take place uh, furiously all right all those people who are behind they're gone they're gone okay, okay. <laughs> yeah you really see what i think is interesting is if you want to jump back to when hickman first gets really relevant in the marvel universe what he seems to be doing is kind of trying to clean up continuity even though he's at points convoluting it he's at least trying to give it like straight lines through i yeah. think that's the point of shield i think that was the point of fantastic four i think his avengers run is more just sort of acknowledging the state of the company at the time like it just seems like a logical extension of that basically he comes back and what it looks like he's trying to do is create not only a solid timeline for x-men but get things back to a point where he and other writers can kind of use their favorite things from X-Men again and not have to be as tied down to whatever the last event book was. Yeah, uh, I mean, they'll be tied down to this book pretty heavily, it seems like, because we talked about Morrison kind of sending the X-Men into the world, and this seems to do that again, especially in House of X. It's actually extremely Morrison-esque, I would say. Outside of their sort of idiosyncratic dialogue and structure, it, it, and the structure is something I want to get into in a little bit too. It's very Hickman structure. It's very Hickman structure, but it does have that sort of feel of a Morrison type story where it's everything you read is valid. I'm just going to reframe it. Yeah, because uh, at that, this point, well, we'll just say what happens in House of X. Basically, what happens is that mutants come out into the world saying, we have all these medicines that can make you better, and they're grown from flowers on our personal island, Krakoa, which is actually also a mutant. And it gets really crazy because, like, Krakoa can apparently kind of do anything now. Because it makes all these, like, hubs and portals and flowers that cure cancer and make people semi-immortal. But that's sort of the beauty of it is, like, it's... And I always think this is, like, the cool thing when writers are able to reframe things this way is... They're not really going any further than anyone else has. It's just, instead of it being one thing being acknowledged at once, it's like 40 things all existing together and creating this version of mutant kind that is almost demigod-like. Yeah, which is what I wanted to get into, because Hickman's very good about pulling all these different elements together, making one very cohesive, streamlined, well, I wouldn't say streamlined, but like a story. Like, a coherent story. And the demigod part is, like, something he constantly does, too. Hickman likes to play with demigods a lot. That's a theme in a lot of his story from, like, even his indie books in Manhattan Project and East of West is always demigods kind of, like, deciding the fate of mankind. And this is where he plays with a lot with, like, mutants, especially in this book. 
when like Avengers he plays with that a lot. Like Reed Richards and Iron Man and Captain America basically decide the fate of entire universes. He's always about like demigods walking among men and how that affects people and how it affects them. And that seems to be a core of at least House of X and Powers of Ten right now. And what I like about this too is he's doing that, but he's also acknowledging the fact that to most of the population, you're still not really sure if the like the X-Men are like terrorists or if they're maybe like pockets of them are okay, but it, it's it very much plays off of that racism angle, but like it's racism towards someone who seems superior to you, which is yeah, there's the big panel in the last issue of House of X, uh, House of X number one, where Magneto basically floats above everybody. And remember, Magneto is basically a terrorist, and he's only been reformed for the past, like, what, 15 years? Oh, I don't even, it's, it's all, <laughs> I feel like Magneto is, and then he isn't, and then he... It gets, but the basic idea there is, you know, here's someone who is motivated by the idea that his people are supposed to take over. And how he's handling it that week could vary, <laughs> which is a, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, and it's really clearly he's framed with like Neil like floating above like all these ambassadors in Jerusalem, saying you have new gods now. And I think that's kind of the essence of the whole House of X. Where it gets a bit more complicated is with the time travel stuff, with the first issue of Powers of Ten, where they basically jump all across the timelines. Right, and basically show us that this doesn't seem to work out well, no matter what you do. It, well, it seems like it does a thousand years later, and that's kind <laughs> of what they're aiming for, because we'll get straight into it, where, like, in, in the latest issue, it seems like mutant and humankind and machine all kind of merge together into one, like, alien-type-like being. It's funny, you know, you were talking about how the Avengers expanded into this, like, cosmic realm. Maybe that's the direction that he's implying X-Men has to go to. Is... Like the time realm? Like where it's cosmic and, like, time, like thousands of years? You know, you you have a really good basis in the Marvel Universe for demigods, things like that. You know, Eternals, uh, Celestials. Maybe, like, part of the point of this is that eventually this sort of amalgamated version of humanity that is technology and humans and mutants and cell phones <laughs> <laughs> will eventually become the same type of thing that, you know, right now Galactus is. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of what he's pointing at. I, I'm i curious if that's where the book ends up, because it kind of seems like they're making Moira uh, kind of the villain of this. But is she the villain? I, I Hickman's good about making complicated characters because Doom is kind of like that too. Like Doom's kind of the villain for most of it, but he's also kind of not. He does save the universe through these very Machiavellian ways, but he does save the universe. So the catch-up here for those who have decided to continue listening even though they have not read this yet, um, in House of X 2, it's established that Moira Mac McTaggart in the timeline we're familiar with, Moira McTaggart, actually has been a mutant this entire time. Yeah, with the power of reincarnation. So when she dies, she's reborn again as a baby in the same way she was born originally. Which is the kicker. It's not just a reincarnation where, like, Moira McTaggart dies and then shows up somewhere else. She shows up in the same place in the same time over and over and over again. And what we've learned now is... There have been at least 10 timelines, all involving her, Professor X, some form of X-Men, Apocalypse, all the, all the big players all being involved. And the one that we've been reading has been the 10th. And she's taken all this knowledge that she's had over all these lives. And the timeline that we're familiar with is her kind of executing whatever she thinks is this sort of master plan. They don't explain the master plan yet, but it seems like she revealed her powers to Xavier pretty early on, basically right before he goes to college. In the other timelines, she tries all these ideas like trying to kill all mutants, trying to make mutants take over the world, and none of them work. And trying to... My favorite being when she just tries to slaughter Bolivar Trask and his family. Yeah, that was... I like the Apocalypse timeline the best. That was cool, too. Yeah. The Endless War. But they show off all these timelines at the end, and the current 616 timeline is the one we've... is the 10th timeline with Avengers versus X-Men and all of this other stuff. 
I, I think it's interesting because it does seem like they're trying to merge all these timelines together. I'd imagine at some point we'll have like the apocalypse timeline trying to invade or something. You know, they've been doing a lot of sort of, hey, if you want to read the Hickman run, you should read these X-Men stories. And Age of Apocalypse is one of them. I wonder if there isn't more to that too, where perhaps one of the big things that needs that explanation is there are quite a few X-Men who are around who should be dead or not look the way they do, or... <laughs> like Cypher, um, the speculation about whether Cyclops is alive or not, because it could be Mystique. Right, but then they also just had that run where it seemed like he was alive. It's weird. It is very. It seems like it's taking place in this semi-like impermanent reality. I don't know if I even think that. I think it's it has to be this framework, and whatever this framework Moira is going to end up being... I think is going to be the real explanation because he doesn't seem to be not acknowledging anything. So it means he's not really trying to directly retcon things. It's going to be interesting. And, you know, we've already talked about this. He's big on the time travel. Mm -hmm. X-Men in general is big on time travel. There's a lot to play with. And he's big on demigods. I mean, I always find it funny when in the very first page, Xavier basically looks like the maker. Right. Except he has the X on his forehead instead of, like, the weird, long brain. And there's been some talk about that, too. Like, you know, is he going to pop his helmet off and be just, like, this giant brain under there? Like, is he... You know, what could be going on under that giant weird helmet? Yeah, it could not be Xavier because we haven't seen him take off that helmet in that, like, timeline. Again, he's bouncing around. And I think it's also indicative of a lot of Hickman's style because, like, I don't think Hickman's very good with dialogue. So it's kind of hard to tell, like, characters who characters really are, and I think that adds to, like, a mystique of it. Yeah, it's an interesting comment. Uh, it's it's funny where what could be perceived as a weakness of a form can also be sort of a strength. Hickman went into this, I'm sure, knowing that everyone was going to be speculating all the time, like that he had a big responsibility on that. That could be partially engineered, too, where he's if something is slightly ambiguous, that could be intentional that could be something you know a seed planted yeah because characters don't really talk all that differently outside of like magneto like magneto is one of the few voices i read in that book that's like oh this is definitely magneto but all the other characters are kind of like this amorphous like all oh, these feel like all kind of the same character and what i think is also interesting in these books at the time of recording this three of them are out that would yeah. be house, house of, of x1 one and two and powers of ten yeah He's using a lot of graphs and a lot of, like... Uh, he did that a lot in Avengers, too. But what I think is interesting about that is... He loves his graphs. It shows, like, his artistic background, too. It means that he's thinking about the books in, like, a different way than a lot of writers would. And there's always been sort of this strength to writer artists. Uh, Morrison was an artist. A lot of people don't even know that, too, that he did a lot of illustration early on. Having that type of level of control over how the book flows is interesting in itself. And, like, I'm a huge dork for, like, profile books and things. So I've been going nuts reading these. Like, I love it. Like, I love when they break down the timelines and they give me, like, lists of – I love it. The timelines were really cool in the last book. Yeah. You see, like, all the endless war of the apocalypse and, like, exactly when she died in each <laughs> timeline. But I have a theory mm -hmm. going into, like, you know, I'm saying this, what, a quarter of the way into all these issues? Because yeah, it's going to be 12, 12 ultimately 12. before he gets the X-Men. I think the, the sort of ultimate thing that's going to happen in all this is we're just going to be left with a really nice selection of X-Men to play with. And something is going to blow up. Something has to blow up in the X-Men faces, and we're going to end up where the world doesn't trust them. Yeah, I'm even thinking it might split off into its own reality, and because that's always been kind of the joke is like, well, that's why been a people rumor for a long time. Now yeah, too. because why are people afraid of the X Men, but they're not afraid of Spider Man and like all these other like kind of mutant like figures? It solves a problem, but I just I can't. And it is a long. It's it's been a long enough, strong enough rumor that you know it was discussed at some point. Yeah. Like you can't. Like there's no way it didn't come up. But I don't think they would do that. Especially now. Especially where they're clearly going to make X-Men movies. Yeah, they're all consolidated under one thing. And you don't want to separate it that much. Maybe it would be a better idea for everything. I'm not certain it is. 
but I really don't think they'll do that. I think what we're going to end up with is, like I said, this sort of well-stocked <laughs> probably field kill of off. X-Men. <laughs> I think they're going to kill off a lot of the cast. They'll probably kill off... I think they'll probably reduce it to the um, like New Mutants run and then like the original Uncanny stuff. I'm going opposite. I think, I think we're going to get a lot of people back, and I think it's going to be without the pressure to necessarily use all of them, but it doesn't mean they don't have to be there. Okay, because a lot of them and are that still was kind more of around. The, and that was sort of the Morrison thing, too, was like, all those X-Men were around, he just didn't have to use all of them. Right. And it worked out well. I think we're, we're going back in that direction. I, I don't know about that, because it's like that's kind of been a situation for quite a while now, and a lot of them just don't get used at all. Yeah, but I think that has more to do with the specific stories trying to be told. I think if you're acknowledging that they're out there, which I, I don't feel like they necessarily were the last couple of years, it, it changes the way the story plays out. It's 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 definitely an interesting set of books right now. Yeah, it's and, hard to tell where it's going. And it has a lot of good buzz. A lot of people are asking about them who aren't really reading consistently. Because, like you mentioned earlier, it's kind of a fresh start because it's not throwing a whole lot of old characters at you. It's mainly all these new characters like Cardinal, um, the weird hybrid between Magic Colossus and Kitty Pride. Yeah, that's a whole other thing I got to, too, into Powers of Ten with these like future hybrid characters. Yeah, I yeah, I just find it funny with Hickman style. It's like, oh, she's part of the Hound program. You're like, what's the Hound program? Yeah. And then the very next page is a giant like text block <laughs> of the Hound program. That's like, awful. Oh, this is this is exposition, huh? And what's funny is like even that has tinges of Morrison's like Here Comes Tomorrow. Well, yeah, I, I think it was also interesting to see like you see like little taglines, like little numbers on them. Like when they were talking about Sinister, it was like SNS zero zero three or something. Yeah, and I think there's probably clues in that too. I'm sure everything is a clue because and, and there have been a couple of little mistakes, and every time they pop up. They call uh, Hickman will go on like Twitter and like tell everyone like, oh, this is supposed to be this. I don't want to confuse anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even gonna try to decode the the mutant language. Someone else can do that for me. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I, I think it has something to do with something in the Avengers run. It's probably like some Thanos language. I hope it's dupe language. It's just a modified dupe language. <laughs> that I'm hoping for. Ooh, that'd be really cool if it actually is a dupe language. I mean, they merge dupe and code. Well, together. dupe is a mutant language, right? Yeah. But there. people just understand. That's my it. big prediction. It's Duke's Duke? language. That's They're funny. coming back too. You know what? This all works. It does, actually. I think they just glued Dupe to Krakoa, and that's how it works. <laughs> he is. Dupe is. Oh, man. Yeah, let's get to the deep theories. <laughs> it's Wild Child. Wild Child's in the middle of Krakoa. <laughs> but that's kind of been the big revelation right now is that Moira's been a mutant all this time. And that Krakoa has been producing flowers that do something. They they say it does this, but I'm, I'm assuming it's probably going to do something else. Yeah, and maybe maybe that's what blows up in their face. <laughs> and somewhere further down the line is that mutants, man and machine, merge into some kind of man-machine hierarchy, and they go to war against the mutants. But then after that, in like the year 1000, man, machine, and mutants are all together. Which I kind of... I, it seems like Hickman's trying to make it so that, like, oh, the X-Men's big villains have always been man and machine. Right. And it's like, I don't know if I agree with that, because it's also been other man, mutants. machine, and, yeah, other <laughs> mutants. Like, Magneto's and the a, biggest villain, and he's a mutant. And aliens. And aliens. The X-Men well, the fought, aliens every, they fought everything. Well, yeah. The communists sometimes. Well, they're apparently vassals of the Shi'ar Empire and in like the future as well which i think is interesting yeah it's damned bird people <laughs> <laughs> always dating mutants they're crazy for those mutants <laughs> but i guess what we're really establishing is uh hickman opened up a lot of possibilities that weren't there yeah which is uh, kind of characteristic of a all month ago stuff. like this is all three weeks in and it's already like all these crazy possibilities but I think that uh that kind of brings us to the end of our uh, our point here with Hickman. It's it's a lot to absorb <laughs> because Hickman is a very dense writer. Not necessarily a good character writer, but he's a very good like thematic story writer. And I think it's interesting that he I feel like he is sort of the evolution of what was happening in like the late 90s, early 2000s too. 
you know, we were comparing him to Morrison, which I think is a valid comparison. But I also think he's got a little bit of his buddy Bendis in there. I think so, too. He kind of represents, like, a newer style that's been coming out ever since Morrison took the scene where it's like, oh, whatever you do in Run Run, you can bring it to your other runs. Like, right. Remender's been doing that. lemire has been doing that in DC now, too. Bendis does that a lot. And that's kind of been, like, the trend for writers ever since, like, 2006. Right. A new world of possibilities for X-Men as, let's be honest, we're going into what will probably be the Marvel Studios era of X-Men. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, – oh, you can do something. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for listening. Uh, remember to like, comment, subscribe if you're listening to YouTube. Like us and follow us on Spotify because we're going to be putting our stuff on there too. Yeah, that's going to be – well, maybe you're listening to it on Spotify right now. That will be this episode. Yeah. Uh, if we're going to be posting on Vero as well, we have a Twitter, Dissecting Fiction on Twitter, Dissecting Fiction on Instagram, Dissecting Fiction on Facebook. We're on all the social media platforms. It's Dissect Fiction on Twitter because we couldn't fit it. <laughs> Everywhere <laughs> else it's just that. Dissecting Fiction. If you type it in, though, you're going to find it. We're, like, good with the Google. Yeah, and we're, we're on most of the social media platforms where you can follow us. Vinny writes articles pretty frequently. So we have content coming out. We constantly have a contest. Follow us and you'll be able to see our opinions on stuff. And, and expert analysis. X. X, like the X. Ooh. Thing. Maybe I'll use that for an article title. Expert. <laughs> X, explaining the x men. Explaining. The, Examining. I, there's no way it hasn't been done. <laughs> I think there is a YouTube show about that. Oh, boy. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We didn't mean to cut in on your uh, territory. But anyway... We might be back with... Uh, maybe, should we tease it? Yeah. We're it, thinking something... Uh, trying to think of a good way to put it. Do you like Star Wars? Do you like arguing about Star Wars? <laughs> we're, we're covering a director that loves to argue about Star Wars. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good hint. <laughs> <laughs>